Dr. Judy Pa, what got you involved in Alzheimer's? Well, Larry, I started studying Alzheimer's disease about 12 years ago. I, I knew nothing about it, to be honest. And I was introduced to a phenomenal research team investigating Alzheimer's disease. And I met the people afflicted by the disease. I spent a lot of time in our memory clinic to meet these individuals. And um, my heart went out to it. I, I, I hadn't... I don't have it in my family currently, but after meeting these individuals, I, um, I felt such a need to study this further. Based on the current research I was doing, I felt like I, I would be able to help. Liz, you were introduced to it by the terrible fact that your mother has it, right? Mm -hmm. She was diagnosed in 2013. How old was she? My mom was a young 64 years old when she was diagnosed. and. You know, my work now is to help other families know the warning signs because I feel had we known, you know, you just never think Alzheimer's is going to be something that's going to land at your front door. Didn't run in my mom's family and no one had ha ever had a conversation about it in our household. You know, you'd see specials about it, but you thought that happens to other people. And then it came knocking on our door and it was everything from mood changes in my mom to her losing her car keys to... Um, her becoming very um, just anxious about, you know, people taking things from her. And it was just, it was awful because you're in denial of what's actually going on with your parent. Dr. Carolyn Kalustian, she's in Hawaii and she's via Skype. And she currently trains other doctors about early signs of dementia and Alzheimer's. What got you into that? I have uh, the ability to really motivate my colleagues in all the departments I've worked in. I tend to, you know, motivate all of them, educate, and I feel like with the, teaming with the Alzheimer's Association, they mentioned that there's, you know, from the studies they're doing, nine out of 10 primary doctors want more information on how to do this. And I said, then let me do it. And so they actually brought me here to Maui to have, there's a conference starting soon, and I'm gonna be doing just that to primary doctors providing this important information. So hopefully we can diagnose it early and start implementing again, like Liz said, um, dietary changes, exercise, and all the evidence-based treatments that we do have um, to start to delay uh, worsening of the disease. Um, an appropriate diagnosis, because you know Alzheimer's disease is not the only form of memory lo loss, and it's very important that we diagnose it, detect it early, diagnose it correctly, and so that we have a system in place not just patient-centered care, but really a family community-centered care. Is it misdiagnosed? It can be, absolutely. I can't tell you the amount of patients who come in already on some of the medications saying they think it was Alzheimer's, so they started me on this, but they, ne they never mentioned any comprehensive lab work or formal testing, you know, some of the biomarkers and things like that. And so it can be misdiagnosed, and it's important that we rule out um, a mixed picture. It could be two forms of memory dementias uh, together. And so I think it's really important for the community to know that there are programs like the one I work in at USC that do a comprehensive one-day kind of evaluation and include all these sort of testing and then do a family conference to really help correctly diagnose and set up the future with their primaries, you know, down the line, what to expect and what we can do. Also help them enroll in some clinical trials, which are needed. If I could add to what Dr. Klustian mentioned. Sure. So there's also a, a, a large body of research around understanding how best to diagnose Alzheimer's disease, but also understanding what Alzheimer's disease isn't. So understanding if there are other types of underlying disease processes or etiologies that are contributing that could be tr treatable in different ways. And this area of research has expanded um, the work from the Alzheimer's Association, from federal funding through the National Institutes of Health. They have now, under now understand that it's, it's not just Alzheimer's disease, it's Alzheimer's disease and related, related dementias. What is dementia and what's the difference? So dementia is a description of the syndrome an individual presents with or, or suffers from. Um, the formal definition is once the person is no longer able to take care of themselves, things um, that we take for granted, driving to the grocery store, paying our bills, getting up and getting dressed in the morning, taking showers by ourselves, those are the types of features that somebody with dementia has. The misconception is that there are 
there's only one cause, which isn't true. Like Dr. Kloustian had mentioned, there's several different underlying origins that can lead to dementia. Some are reversible, many are not, and Alzheimer's disease is one of those. It's a disease of the brain. The major risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is aging. As we get older, our risk for Alzheimer's disease increases. And once we cross over into that stage of no longer being able to care for ourselves, we have dementia. Prior to that, there's risk factors. And if we can identify those risk factors and those signs early enough, we can start to intervene. We can have those difficult conversations with mom and dad and say, mom, I'm worried about you. Let's take a look at your lifestyle. Let's see what you're currently doing. Are you withdrawing are you, or are you engaging with social groups? Are you challenging your mind? Are you getting up off the couch and taking a walk around the neighborhood, taking in all of the sights, helping your brain have some exercise? It's really this idea, Larry, of use it or lose it. It's a terrible disease for the caregiver, right? It's awful. You know, the first few years I cared for my mother and it's, it's really hard, you know, because you're, as a child, you're already going through the fact that your, your parent is losing their memory and, um, and slowly forgetting their own memories and forgetting their family members and how to care for themselves. So, you know, the, the biggest thing you can do for them is to remind them that they are not the disease, that is, it's still them. And, you know, the hardest part was watching your, my mother go back um, almost to become like a child. You know, I would have to shower with her. I would have to eat and cut her food for her. I would have to remind her where we were. I had to calm her down in instances where she would come to and not know why she where, was where she was or what was happening. And it's a heartbreaking disease. Does it drive you a little crazy? So I'll ask this to Dr. Caroline, that you can't show me any pill that has helped a little bit? It's, it's, it's tough. Um, however, I'm in the practice of older adult medicine, and we aren't big fans of prescribing pills necessarily. We do see in older adults, medications have side effects, but are you know, affect older adults more than the side effects at a younger age. And so they're usually, as they get older, on multiple drugs, have different multiple illnesses that they're battling. And so we don't always find, you know, help from a drug. So it's not new for us. Um, but it is challenging um, not to have a cure. It is challenging not to know um, all the specifics of the pathophysiology to be able to stop it in its tracks. Um, but I do have hope and faith and, and now that we can actually diagnose some reversible causes i can provide some comfort in in being sure of the diagnosis and again like dr pa said um having these tough conversations you know the diagnosing this has medical social emotional um benefits financial also you could plan ahead these are not to be you know, considered small things. These are very important when you're in that family and you're dealing with it. So yes, it is frustrating, but um, I'm hopeful. But one of the things I did want to add on to is as families, we cannot be afraid to have these conversations with our parents about how they want to be cared for if this does come across our door, because that's the hardest part, I think, of this disease or any disease is wanting to know how you're gonna care for your parent, do they have money put aside for their care, and how you're gonna to come together as a family, because a disease like this make or, break, make or breaks a family. Carolyn, what's the number one preventative? The number one thing we can do is uh, exercise regularly and avoid some of the things that will worsen our risk, which is uncontrolled blood pressure, uncontrolled cholesterol, um, obesity, smoking, these are things we know if we can control those vascular risk factors and exercise that we can at least delay um, any sort of memory diagnosis. And so we're hopeful that, you know, with the correct management of those risk factors, that's probably one of the best evidence-based things that we, we, you know, we do for this is recommending that exercise and then controlling the vascular risk factors, such as using blood pressure medications if needed to really, you know, there was the study that said 19% um, were less likely by doing that 
to get diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. And so we have a lot more to, to do. Judy, have you seen people better than they were five years ago? So in our research studies, we tend to follow them over several years. And unfortunately, a lot of the trials that we currently have, they go for six months, two, up to two years. And I mean, I think to Liz's point, it's really about prevention. It's really about identifying early risk factors as early as we can. So there's been a large worldwide study that has shown that these prevention risk factors account for a third of the cases of dementia worldwide. So if we can control these factors, if we understand a lot of the, the ones um, like Dr. Kloustian mentioned, we can bring down risk. And ultimately, we want to keep the brain as healthy as long as possible. So I absolutely agree, and I believe that if we target primary prevention, secondary prevention in people who already have symptoms, that we can start to reduce um, those symptoms and we can help them stay as healthy for as long as possible. Never miss a beat. Subscribe to Larry King now and watch new episodes every day.